الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد حبيبت في الله we reach the eighth naqid min nawaqid al-islam and this is as Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala mentions mudahirat al-mushrikeen wa mu'awanatuhum ala al-muslimin it is assisting and supporting the pagans against the Muslims. Imam Muhammad ibn Dhuhab rahimahullah ta'ala said, Al-Thamin, Mudahiratu al-Mushrikeen wa mu'awanatuhum ala al-Muslimin. Wa dalil, qawluhu ta'ala, wa man tawallahum minkum, fa innuhu minhum. إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين. إمام محمد بن عبد الوهاب رحمه الله تعالى said the eighth nullifier. That means this is the eighth concept or eighth way. In which one's Islam is nullified, meaning one becomes a disbeliever due to this. And we already mentioned in the beginning of the treaties that, of course, that there are many more than ten Noah al Islam, but that these happen to be some of the most prominent during the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah taala. So he said, the eighth nullifier: anyone who assists. Or aids polytheists against Muslims has disbelieved. The evidence for this is the statement of the Almighty: "Whoever from amongst you takes them as allies, then he is surely one of them, and Allah does not guide the wrongdoers." I have to feel out very important before we get into this, and as we get into the explanation with re, uh, with regards to this nullifier of Islam, to get an understanding. A difference between Ahl Islam or Ahl Sunnah and the people of Ahl Bid'ah, like the uh, Tekfiri, Khawarij groups, because basically they take a lot of these texts. For example, the text of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Wahhab, and, and specifically this text, the Nawaqid Al Islam, Al Qaeda, all of these groups, and they agree that he was a great Imam. However, they take what he says in those texts, as far as the those uh, ibarat that are very concise, very precise, and are giving you a general ruling, and without the details. And they take those principles and then they apply it to any and everyone they believe who fits this description and they make takfir of them. This is differ this differs with the process, the minhaj, the methodology of Ahlus Sunnah. The Ahlus Sunnah, they look to those details. They bring those details. They look at the whole Sharia. They look at what uh, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the methodology of the Salaf al Salih. They go to the Mufassireen, the people who, uh, uh, the Imams of Tafsir, who explain the Quran. They go to the Muhaddithin and their Shurahat. They go to the, uh, the Imams of Hadith and their explanations of the Hadith. And this is how they gain understanding. Because if you were to take this principle on its, just its open apparent meaning, then it could lead to some very damaging and very distorted conclusions that goes against the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we're going to get into this mas'ala or these various masail, these furur, these 
uh, principles that branch off from this base text and from some of these base, uh, some of these uh, masail, and we're gonna we're gonna fill in some of those details, and they comes from the ulama, and it comes from their understanding of the nusus. What are the nusus? What do I mean when I say nusus? And the uh, the singular of nusus is nus. A nus refers to text. Nusus is the plural text with a, a s on the end. And when we're talking about nus, generally we're talking about the sacred nus, the nus of the Quran, and the nus of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, we refer to other texts as nus. If you want to say the nus of Imam Muhammad Abu Wahab, then we'll read that statement. But the nus that we are, uh, that we must uphold, and that we must believe in, and that is clear, and uh, is is a part of our iman, is the nus. Believing in the nas and acting upon the nas of the Quran and the nas of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, one of the uh, first, we'll give a general description of this naqat, and then we'll get into some some great benefits that uh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad uh, Sheikh Muhammad Bazmul, Hafidullah Ta'ala one of our ulama in Mecca uh, some of the great fantastic fawaid that he brings and the way he brings those masail, those issues so this means assisting the polytheists against Muslims, for instance if there was fighting between uh, disbelievers and Muslims and someone used means to assist and support the disbelievers against the Muslims providing wealth or weapons, strategic planning, or even assisting them in plotting, then this individual has disbelieved. This is the general understanding of the Nus, but there's so many details that we have to get into. This is because this person has preferred the disbelievers to the believers. This necessitates that they hate Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Hazm said, it is correct that taking the saying of the Almighty Whoever from amongst you takes them as allies, then he is surely one of them. In its literal meaning, okay, so we just take the text in its very in its literal literal meaning only. He said, in its literal meaning is that whoever does this is a disbeliever from amongst the disbelievers in general. And this is correct, and no two Muslims would disagree to this. Okay, this is what Ibn Hazm says. Sheikh Abdulaziz Arais, uh, one of our contemporary scholars, added, The criterion for the love that constitutes disbelief is a tawalli The principle, a tawalli Loving the disbelievers for their religion. Or supporting them for its sake. And being pleased with it. So if there is assistance without these motives, then it is considered for worldly benefit and it is prohibited and not disbelief. So that's very important for us to understand that there's a concept, uh, al-mawalat and a tawalli and some of these principles, some of these concepts, I don't want to make it too complex, but hopefully all of us can gain some understanding that yes, in general, this is a, an act of disbelief, but there are details, and especially without question, it's an act of disbelief, if you are supporting them in their their religion and for their religion, you are uh, pleased with their shirk and so forth. But if it is for some worldly benefit, then of course it does not uh, necessitate uh, taking one out of the fold of Islam. And we're going to bring you the evidence because I know some people are ready, they're itching, and they're standing on the edges of their seat especially if they have any uh, influence from the Tekfiris or perhaps some of the details because not all the ulama of Ahl Sunnah bring these same details. But the evidences come from Nusus and we're going to get to those texts. Al-Muwalat, 
supporting, loving, or assisting is of two types. Al Muwalat al Mukaffara. Okay, that means to uh, support or love or assist, which takes one out of the fold of Islam. Al Muwalat al Muwalat al Muharrama. Uh, this does not expel a person from the fold of Islam. If they have this kind of support or this kind of love, it does not take a person out of the fold of Islam. And there's a third category, which is not mentioned here, and we'll get to it when we get to some of the details from Sheikh uh, Muhammad Bazmul, which is supported by very clear evidence. And this is something for those of us who live, who come from non-Muslim lands, and we have non-Muslim relatives, and so forth, this helps us to get a better grasp of these concepts. Because if you take the apparent meaning of these, these, te these texts, meaning the text of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, and, and those ayat, without knowing anything about the tafsir, without going to other uh, verses, without going to the sunnah, to know how to understand and practice those verses, then you can definitely be led astray. And this is why sometimes you get questions. Sometimes I've had questions uh, uh, Muslim reverts who say, you know, my mother uh, has pork in the refrigerator. If I am in the house with her, is this loving her? Is this supporting her? Am I a disbeliever? You know, really strange questions because, the, you know, they're trying to practice, but they don't have the uh, full and proper concept of these these uh, very complex concepts. These are not basic concepts, by the way. When we study this treatise, if we were just to read the treatise and just make some tariqat, I it, it would not do justice because the, these are intensely and immensely complex concepts. Otherwise, there would not be so much evidence from the, sh the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah to show us otherwise. Now, so al mawalat we mentioned those two types, and again I said there's a, another uh, another type, and we'll get into al mawalat al mukaffara is complete love, and it includes loving the religion of the disbelievers, loving the success of the disbelievers over Muslims, or openly showing signs of it. Okay, Sheikh Abd, uh, Abdullah ibn Abdul Latif. This is one of the Imam uh, Dawa, one of the uh, the Imams who uh, are uh, either related to or students of Sheikh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and those and in the Arab Peninsula that were related to his dawah. So Imam or Sheikh Abdullah ibn Abdul Latif was asked about the difference between a tawalli and muwalat. And he replied, a tawalli is major disbelief and it is supporting them with wealth physically and offering them opinion. Al-Muwalat is one of the major sins, assisting them physically or financially or sharpening their pens or smiling at them or exalting their point of view. All of this, when these actions are done to assist disbelievers over Muslims, Al-Utaybi explains, uh, all of this is when these actions are done to assist disbelievers over Muslims. So this is very important. So. Imam uh, Sheikh uh, Abdullah ibn uh, Abdul Latif mention those things when it's the major uh, or when it's the uh, it's a major sin and he mentioned sharpening their pens and smiling at them and Allah knows best where this evidence comes from but uh, that's why Sheikh uh, al Utaybi mentioned that the disbelievers over the uh, that this is in the case of when they're being supported when they are uh, smiling in that them to assist them in supporting support over the uh, over the Muslims but in that issue that require uh, another you know that takes really looking into that issue because we have so much ample evidence from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba radiyallahu anhu of how they treated and, and, and not just did business, but the Prophet ﷺ cried over his uncle, uh, Ibn Ab uh, Ab Abdul Muttalib, when he died. He cried, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He loved him, yes, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He loved him and he was a pagan. The Prophet ﷺ loved him and he was a pagan. 
So what are you going to say against evidence like this from Kitab, from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam? This shows us that obviously we cannot just take those general missiles and run with them and, uh, and, and, and these things have to be contextualized. And the Prophet والسلام, died and he had armor that was uh, on pawn with the Yahud, showing us there was Mu'amalat. The Prophet والسلام, visited a sick Yahudi in the hot in, in the not in the hospital, but when he was sick in his home, a young boy. And he gave him dawah. How can you give someone dawah if you hate them? To the extreme that that, that the people have this tasawar. Uh, with al wala wal bara That's why it's very important to contextualize these texts. It's very important to understand. And everything, we go back to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then you'll have light and guidance in this way. You know, that of how to deal with relatives and others who are non Muslim. And that will help extinguish the type of hatred and extremism that we see, uh, unfortunately, produced in our community from especially the Tekfiriyin and some of the others who follow their Medheb and Minhaj. Sheikh Otebi explains, supporting disbelievers in their opinions without loving or assisting their religion is from sinful Mu'alat. And it is not from the Mu'alat and Mukaffara according to the consensus of Ahlul Sunnah like the Sheikh mentioned. Then we move to the evidence of the Mu'alat and it has different categories that it can sometimes be major disbelief and sometimes major sin. And this is the case of uh, Hatib ibn Abdul Balta radiallahu ta'ala A letter was brought to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it contained a statement from Hatib to some of the Mecca, uh, the people, the Meccan disbelievers informing them of some of the intentions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O Hatib, what is this? Hatib uh, replied, O Messenger of Allah, don't hasten to give your judgment about me. I was a man closely related to the Quraysh, but I did not belong to this tribe. While the other immigrants with you had their relatives in Mecca who would protect their dependents and property. So I wanted to recompense for my lacking blood relation to them by doing them a favor so they might protect my dependents. I did this neither because of disbelief nor apostasy, nor out of preferring disbelief to Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Hatib has told the truth. Umar radiallahu said, O Messenger Allah, allow me to chop off the head of this hypocrite. Radiallahu ta'ala the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Hatib, uh, participating in the Battle of Badr, and who knows, perhaps Allah has already looked at the warriors of Badr and said, do whatever you like, for I have forgiven you. Sheikh Abdulaziz Arais states, the speech of Hatib, in addition to the fact that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concurred, is clear evidence that the action of Hatib was in and of itself not disbelief. This is why he said, I did this neither because of disbelief nor apostasy, nor out of preferring disbelief to Islam. Therefore, if the action of Hatib was disbelief, then he would not needed to say, I did this neither because of disbelief, because the action in and of itself would have been sufficient to expel him from Islam. Likewise, it is not correct for the one who ridicules Allah to say, I did not say it out of disbelief, because ridiculing Allah in and of itself is disbelief. So that shows us the difference in those two mas'ala. And that goes back to the naqid we already talked about, about ridiculing the religion or the signs of Allah. That in and of itself denotes disbelief. Whereas this naqid requires additional tafsil because we have this tafsil, these details from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, from the action of Hatib radiallahu ta'ala an, and from the actions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how he dealt with uh, various non-Muslims. Sheikh Abdul, uh, Abdul Latif bin uh, Hassan said, or Hassan said, Hatib was referred to and described as having Iman. This abandonment entails a general prohibition and as a specific circumstance which shows his intent. 
and by analyzing the magnificent verse, it can be perceived that the action of Hatib is a type of Mawalat, and that he informed them out of love. So the one who does this has been misguided off the correct way. However, his statement opened the way for him. He has told you the truth. The apparent meaning shows he did not become a disbeliever as long as he was a believer in Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam without any doubt or uncertainty. Instead, he did that to gain a worldly benefit. So that shows us the two different types of mawalat. If Hatib would have fallen into disbelief, that made him that would have made him a, an apostate. It would have nullified his previous deeds and this shows that just having an outward action of assisting the disbelievers or what appears to be love for them, you know, in supporting against a Muslim, is not always disbelief and the intention of the one who does an action like this should be clarified. Was it for supporting their religion or worldly benefit or not? Imam al-Qurtabi mentioned some of the benefits of the story of Hatib being the person who commits a major sin does not become a disbeliever and that the one who misinterprets is excused unlike the one who does an action unintentionally. So it shows us also the other be ta'wil or by misinterpreting or misconstruing the text. And also accepting information from someone who is truthful and the permissibility of searching a woman out of necessity because this also took place in the hadith in order to find the letter that was uh, that was intercepted, the letter of Hatim. We can also benefit from this hadith that Mawalat, even if it's apparent, can at times be major sin but not disbelief, and that sometimes due to misinterpretation, a person can be excused for their sin or even kufr as it is one of the prohib uh, prohibitions to making takfir of an individual, going back to the original principles that we laid down. The position of the Salaf and later scholars regarding this issue, meaning the issue that took place with Hatib, uh, and relating to, because this was in fact a type of spy. What do we, so this is going to show you the difference between Ahl Sunnah and the Minhaj of the Salaf compared to what we see from groups like uh, ISIL and ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other groups who, and Al-Shabaab through their paranoia through their extremism that they execute anyone who differs with them and anyone who they perceive as spying on them and definitely those for sure who they uh, uh, who, who, who spy upon them without any question they execute them there's immense amount of videos immense amount of evidence showing how they beautify the slaughtering and killing of human beings so regarding the verse whoever from amongst you takes them as allies then he is surely one of them Abu Fadl al-Ulusi said it refers to a real disbeliever like them and it was mentioned on Ibn Abbas that this is if they love them because they are Jews and Christians so letting them know that you know not just being an ally in any capacity that you just make take fear of them and you make their blood lawful and so forth but no rather this is bringing some of those details of the Salaf and statements like Ibn Abbas saying that this is if they love them, meaning that they, these people have disbelieved and has become one of them if they love them because of their, their religion, their deen. All the four Imams, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmed, all believed that a Muslim spy who gave secrets to the disbelievers was still a Muslim. And this was the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al-Qayyim. Likewise, Imam Hafid ibn Hajar related, Imam al-Tahawi said, there, were, there was consensus that a Muslim spy should not be killed, which shows he is not considered a disbeliever. SubhanAllah, look at the statements of the Salaf. We just mentioned the four Imams of Fiqh. We mentioned Shaykh al-Islam ibn, Tay, uh, ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, we mentioned the statement of Imam al-Hafid uh, ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. We mentioned the statement, uh, or we mentioned his statement, relate, he related about Imam al-Tahawi. 
And Imam Atawi said that there's consensus that a Muslim spy should not be killed and that he's not a disbeliever. Consensus, that means ijma. Imam Sa'di explained the above verse by saying, the complete tawalli necessitates changing their religion, whereas the minor tawalli is a means to the major tawalli. Then it has different levels until one becomes a slave from amongst them. So letting us know, giving us those details, that there's, uh, there's times when a person is sinned, there's times when a person is uh, taken out of the fold of Islam, and there are times when actually if there are types of love, the natural love, which we'll get into and so forth, when there's no, nothing wrong with that, that that is a part of our human nature. And we're not, uh, we're not held accountable for the, the love, our natural love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put for our families and for, uh, you know, others that we, we cooperate. Even if they disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah guide us in them. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. Shaykh Muhammad Amin al-Shanqiti and Rahimahumullah Jameen explain. The apparent meaning of the, of the verse is that whoever loves disbelievers intentionally, by choice, desiring them, is a disbeliever like them. al race elucidates, uh, so he did not uh, declare the general takfir. Instead, he compared it to something related to creed or belief in the heart, loving the disbelievers by desiring them. So this had a, an issue of creed. Those people who love to make taklid of, of, of disbelief and, and, and the people of disbelief and their deen. Wallah musta'an. Wallah musta'an. The committee of major scholars in Saudi Arabia uh, was asked, what is the meaning of the verse, do not love uh, people that anger, that the anger of Allah is upon? In Surah Al-Mumtahina, verse 13. And what is the meaning of wilaya, guardianship, or loving them? Is it considered loving them to visit them, speak, and laugh with them? They answered, Allah the Almighty has prohibited the believers from loving the Jews and other than them from amongst the disbelievers and allegiance, love, affection, brotherhood, and support and taking them as protectors if they are not fighting uh, the Muslims. The Almighty says, you, uh, uh, you will not find the people who believe in Allah in the last, mess, uh, in the last day making friendship with those who oppose Allah and His Messenger, even though they were their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their kindred. For such He has written faith in their hearts and strengthened them with guidance from Himself. And He will admit them to gardens underneath which rivers flow to dwell therein. Allah is pleased with them and they with Him. They are the party of Allah. Verily is the party of Allah that will be successful. And this is in Surah Al-Mujadila, verse 22. Allah also says, O you believe, take not as protectors those outside your religion, since they will not fail to do their best to corrupt you. They desire to harm you severely. Hatred has already appeared from their mouths, but what their hearts conceal is far worse. Indeed, we have made plain to you the verses, if you understand. Lo, you are the ones who love them, but they love you not. Then Allah says, but if you remain patient, and become pious, not the least harm will their cunning do to you. Surely Allah surrounds all that they do. And this is in Ali Imran, uh, verses 118 to 120. This is the meaning according to the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah the Almighty did not prohibit the believers from being humane and receiving kindness from those who do not make war with them and exchanging permissible mutual benefits with them. Like buying and selling, giving and accepting gifts, Allah says, Allah does not forbid you to deal justly and kindly with those who fought not against you on account of your religion, nor drove you out of your homes. Verily, Allah, Allah loves those who deal with deal justly. It is only as regards those who fought against you on account of your religion and have driven you out of your homes and helped to drive you out that Allah forbids you to befriend them. And whoever will befriend them then such are the wrongdoers. And this is also in, in, in Surah Al-Mumtahina, verses 8 and 9. So, in short, working with disbelievers for worldly purposes and necessity and having natural love for one's family and kin from, uh, from non-Muslims is not disbelief, nor is it sinful. However, loving and aiding disbelievers in order to harm Muslims with the intent to do so or to assist them in disbelief is disbelief. Sheikh Saleh bin Fozan was asked about some Muslims who apparently, meaning on the, uh, it appears to people 
that they love and assist disbelievers. He responded by saying, I do not believe that there is a Muslim that loves disbelievers. However, you explain al muwalat other than its real meaning. Therefore, if he loves them, then he is either ignorant or not a Muslim or from the hypocrites. As for the Muslim, he does not love the disbelievers. But there are some things that you classify as mawalat, and it is not mawalat, like buying and selling from disbelievers or giving them a gift or accepting one. This is all permissible. This is not from mawalat, but instead from worldly matters for mutual benefit, like contracting a disbeliever for work, and this is exchanging mutual benefit. The Prophet wasallam contracted Abdullah ibn uh, uh, Aritat al-Laythi to guide him on the Hijra road, and he was a disbeliever. He sought his support and experience on the road, so it is permissible to do so. What are you going to say about the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are you going to say that he fell into kufr? Wa'iyadhan billah? And this shows you the difference. Ahlul Sunnah goes back to those nusus. They go to the text. They go to what, how the Messenger of Allah... Before we go back to even what the scholars say, we go back to Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we can get the most appropriate... And, 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 and uh, understanding because that's the asl, that's what Dalil is. Dalil is not call a sheikh so and so, call a sheikh so and so, call a takfiri so and so, call a imam, imam uh, uh, kufr, imam dalal, imam takfir, so and so. La. But the Dalil is from the Quran and from the Sunnah and from the Ijma, that which is consensus. And a qiyas a sahih, you know, making uh, sound an analogies. And this is for ahla fiqh. This is for the people who have fiqh and knowledge who can make those uh, analogies and, and make uh, a qiyas and, and, and apply those principles. Not just for you and I and just anyone. Some of the important details that we want to look at, as uh, Sheikh Muhammad Bezmu, he, he framed this very, very lovely, so we'll read some of the benefits from the Sheikh and do our best to translate bi'idnillah ta'ala. Uh, he said, the su'al, one of the questions regarding this issue, he said, hal ayya hub wa ayya nusra tukun lil kafir hiya min kufr makhraj min al millah. He said, is any kind of love or is all types of love and all types of uh, assisting a disbeliever, does that entail the disbelief which takes a person out of the fold of Islam, which is a legitimate question. He said, وَجَدْنَا الْقُرْآنَ الْكَرِيمِ ذِكْرْ وَكُوْ عَنْوَا مِنَ الْحَبْ مِنَ الْحُبْ لِلْكُفَارِ دُونِ أَنْ يَحْكَمَ عَلَىٰ أَسْحَابِهَا بِأَنَّهُمْ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ وَأَنَّهُمْ كَفْرُوا بِسَبَبِ هَذَا الْحُبْ فَمِثْلًا نَجِدْ آيَةً في القرآن الكريم تذكر أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يحب أن يسلم بعد الكفار. And then Allah subhanahu wa taala revealed إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء وهو أعلم بالمهتدين. So the Sheikh answered that question by saying. We find in the Quran al Karim uh, things mentioned about the different types of love for the disbelievers. Without ruling upon them, the person falls into this love to be a disbeliever. So that means you find this as a nas, as nasus in the Quran. And he said, and that they disbelieve. And also that you find that some that they disbelieve for due to the fact of having love for disbelievers. And then he gives an example. He said, for example, we find in the verse in the Quran al karim mentioning that the Prophet ﷺ used to love that some of the disbelievers would become Muslim, that they would accept Islam. The Prophet ﷺ loved this. That means it was a part of his heart. He loved this. He wanted them to accept. He wanted his uncle to accept Islam. He loved that. He wanted some of those Quraysh and some of those tribal leaders to accept because then their whole tribes, that would have a big major influence. Uh, and then, so he mentions as Dalil and evidence for this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qasas, uh, 
verse 56, I believe. Uh, he said, Verily, you do not guide those whom you love. However, Allah guides whomsoever he, he wishes. And he is the most knowledgeable about those who are guided. Imam uh, Tabari mentioned about this verse in his tafsir. يقول تعالى ذكر ذكره لنبيه صلى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم إنك يا محمد لا تهدي من أحببت هدايته ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء أن يهديه من من خلقه وبتوفيقه للإيمان به وبرسوله ولو قيل معناه إنك لا تهدي من أحببته لقرابته لقرابته منك ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء كان مذهبا وهو أعلم بالمحتدين يقول جل ثناؤه والله أعلم من سبق له في علمه في علمه أنه يهدي للرشاد ذلك الذي يهديه الله فيسدده ويوفقه Imam Tabari said about the verse we, we, we mentioned that this was addressing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Oh Muhammad, uh, and that you can't guide whom you wish, uh, meaning to give them the guidance. They, they, you cannot force them to believe. And you can try and make effort, but the end result is from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That hidayah, that uh, hidayah tawfiq, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is very important. Uh, so, to give a bil ikhtisar, to let us know what we learn from the kalam, the, the statement of Imam al-Tabari, and that the ulama mentioned on countless occasions, that hidayah is of two types. Hidayah, hidayah to irshad, wa hidayah to tawfiq. Hidayah to irshad means like da'wah. For example, if we're doing a lecture, and we're lecturing to non-Muslims, and Muslims. This is hidayah to irshad. This means we're giving them uh, guidance, we're giving them uh, information to, uh, to, you know, evidences to, to guide them to Islam or guide them to the Sunnah. Okay? That is hidayah to irshad. Hidayah to tawfiq is the guidance of whether they accept or not. And that's only in the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَكَنَ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءَ However, Allah guides whomsoever He pleases. Because the ultimate guidance, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that I was a non-Muslim for so many years in my life, and then I met some Muslims, and, and I had been studying and stuff, all that guidance, I, you know, from books, and the little bit from my encounters and my co-workers, that was a part of Irshad. But what actually allowed for me to embrace Islam, it was hidayah to tawfiq min Allah Azza wa Jal. It was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah guided me, chose to guide me for whatever reason that, that for, for my benefit, to give me that benefit, to, to take me from dhulamat al nur, to take me from darkness to light. That's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can guide and strive and make effort because the Prophet and Islam strove and made effort. Who is the best of of uh, sources of, of guidance of the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was unable to guide all the people he wanted to. That that guidance of tawfiq, because that only comes from Allah That's the shahid there. Also with relates to this, there's a statement of Imam Sa'di, which also affirms this, but I don't want to uh, take too long in reading all these statements and translating into English. So let's go to some of the most important aspects that I want to mention here uh, with regards to some of the texts that affirm for us that there are different types of mawalat and sometimes it's not even sinful that if you have a love. One of the things uh, the Sheikh mentions, he says, مثلاً تجد أن الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يتعامل مع الكفار والمشركين الذين كانوا في المدينة من اليهود والنصارى وغيرهم معاملات حسنة Sanakha 
عن أنس رضي الله تعالى عنه أن يهود يهوديا دعا رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم إلى خبز شعير إلى آخر حديث فأجاب صلى الله عليه وسلم فأجابه صلى الله عليه وسلم طيب one of the examples the Sheikh mentions he said that that we have and he said that this is one example the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to deal with the non-Muslims the kuffar the disbelievers the mushrikeen the pagans and all, and, and uh, the in Medina and the the Jews and the Christians and other than them with good good uh, good and righteous way he dealt with them with kindness with hasana in a very good good way and that even a a, a Jew had um, invited the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to eat some bread and some other foods and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam accepted and then we mentioned the hadith it is the hadith of Anas radiyallahu ta'ala and you'll find it in uh, akhrajuhu ahmed it's in musnad imam ahmed uh, and uh, it looks like imam shafi'i in his book ar risala also also another example wa mata wa dar'uhu marhun and the yahudi an aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha qalat Tawafiya Rasul Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa dir'uhu marhuna marhunatun inda al-yahudi bi thalathin sa'in min sha'ir so uh, also another example is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he died that his his armor was on pawn or loan to a Jew that the Jew, uh, that, uh, that the Jew held his, his armor uh, because of, he gave him in exchange as a pawn uh, uh, some sha'ir, some uh, barley, I think sha'ir is barley or wheat. Sha'ir is, is barley, I believe. So this shows us that also transactions perfectly permissible. And the Prophet ﷺ dealt with Yahud. And in the other example, the Prophet ﷺ dealt with Yahud, as we mentioned. Also, that a woman came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ummi mushrika zaratni wazaratuha min Mecca ila Medina. Aakramaha? Qala naam. Aakramiha? And then he mentioned the ayah in Mumtahina about being just with the uh, non-Muslims as long as they are not fighting you or trying to kill you. So here a woman came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she said, Oh Messenger of Allah, uh, my mother is, is a pagan and she visited me. And I visited her from Mecca uh, coming from Mecca to Medina or she came from Mecca to Medina should I be uh, generous and, and, and you know generous towards her so she was asking about her mother she wanted to know the hukum because she knew those those verses uh, you know so you know she was asking for clarification should I be kind to her she's a Muslim she disbelieves in Allah wa Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she's on shirk you know a mushrika the Prophet ﷺ said, Nam. said, yes, you know, akramaha. And then, and that's exactly what he said, akramiha, be generous to her. And uh, be righteous towards her. And then he mentioned the ayat, which is in Surah Al-Mumtahina, we already mentioned, which is verse 8 through 9. In another narration, so this shows us what? This is clear evidence, you know, because sometimes you hear strange fatawa. And that's why we have to put the fatawa that we hear, because often they're just fatawa. The sheikh is asked, should we? And the sheikh maybe doesn't even, you know, has no idea what it's like to live in a non-Muslim society, has no idea what it's like to have non-Muslim relatives, and is overlooking some of those nasus which show us clearly that we should be kind and gentle and honoring our parents, regardless whether they're Muslim or not. And this is a clear example here. And here's another text uh, which illustrates the word. An Asma bint Abi Bakr, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, qalat, ataytani ummi ragabatin fi ahdi nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
فَسَعَلْتُ نَبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَأَسِلْهُ أَأَسِلُهَا أَأَسِلُهَا قَالَ النَّعَمْ The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was asked by Asma bint Abi Bakr رضي الله تعالى عنها She said her mother came to me during the time of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم desiring something and so she asked the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم about it and she she said should I uh, you know basically maintain these ties of kinship and 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 you know basically assist her and so you know and so forth and the Prophet ﷺ said Nam yes. And there are many, many other examples. Another example is the hadith uh, of Anas, radiallahu ta'ala an. Kana gulam yahudiyun yakhdamu nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fa marida. Fa atahu wa nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yu'uduhu fa ka'ada inda rasihi rasihi fa qala lahu aslim fa nadhara ila abihi وهو عنده فقال فقال له أطيع أبو قاسم صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسلم فخرج نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو يقول الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أنقذه من النار. A beautiful hadith. This is the last statement we want to mention. Is this beautiful text which illustrates for us how we should be with. other than uh, you know non-Muslims. This is a hadith of Anas radiallahu ta'ala. He said that a a young Jewish boy used to to serve the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he w- used to assist the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and serve him, you know, like a servant. And he became sick. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to to visit him. So that shows us what? It's permissible to visit a non-Muslim. They're sick. Whatever the case may be. فقاعد in the rasi. So the Prophet ﷺ sat close near to his head. And he said to him, he said, Embrace Islam. Very simple statement. Aslam. Embrace Islam. So then the boy, he looked to his father. And his father said, Obey Abu Qasim. Oh, you know, obey the pro- obey the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And his pro- his father was a Yahud. They were both Jews. And his father said, "Obey him." Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So then the boy became Muslim. Walhamdulillah. And uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam left. And when he left, he said, "Alhamdulillah, ladi ankadhu min al nar." All praise belongs to the one who took them took him from the hellfire. That shows us the importance of da'wah, and it shows us that we have to have good mu'amalat with non-Muslims and with everyone, and that's a big part of da'wah. Lean, wurrif, being gentle, and and kind with people, and that sets that example. So that we have to use that. That's a part of this this qaida. It shows the complexity of this issue. That it's not simply we can just read a statement and make takfir of anyone we think who's violating it. And it's not simple that we read the statement and we can be cruel and inhumane to everyone. Wa'iyadi billah or anyone for that matter. But instead, we have to look at the details. How did Ahl Islam understand it? From the Quran and the Sunnah. How did it come from the, what are the verses? What does the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? And how was the Sabeel of the, the Salaf al-Saleh? So this is very important. And I hope that it was clear and I ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself. And the shaitan was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.